I'm delighted to be joined by Mary Lee Hannell, uh, who is the Chief of Human Capital for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It's another in our series here of uh, CEO Perspectives podcast, where we focus on the great stories and wonderful careers of so many people in our profession who hold that title. You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. It's it's an absolute delight to uh, to welcome you, Mary Lee. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Mary Lee, I know you spent most of your professional career at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and you've been in this leadership role uh, of the HR function for about a decade or so, but you've had a, a very storied career uh, there, and I, I'm thrilled to uh, to have a few moments with you to to share some of the things that I think are, are unique and inspiring in terms of your leadership, uh, not only of the HR function, but as part of the team uh, that has led the Port Authority in the last few years. I, I wonder, you know, you certainly have oversight of all the traditional pieces of the HR function, but you also play an important role in the comprehensive labor relations uh, for, I think, more than two dozen or so unions. And I can imagine that that is a massive scope and a massive responsibility that not all of your, your colleagues in similar positions might have as part of their remit. I wondered if you could just touch briefly a little bit about uh, your career path, and and then if you could just sort of make sure we're all aware of the sheer size and scope of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and just what's in the remit. Sure, happy to. So I began my career, as you said, most of my professional career at the Port Authority now going on 36 years. I actually was the beneficiary of a program that at the time was called the Influx Program. And it was a program, one of the early diversity programs in the 80s. It was really dedicated to bringing women into uh, the workplace, into the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, Had the good fortune of starting out in the human resources department as you know an entry level management employee eager beaver ready to do anything and everything i had come from an hr background in retail uh, from bloomingdale's actually in in the manhattan flagship store and entered this giant world of the port authority of new york and new jersey which i knew a little bit about because i lived in new jersey and i took the path train into new york city Other than that, I didn't really understand the scope of the Port Authority. And so let me just take a few minutes here to to let everyone know what that's about. The Port Authority is, is, our mission is simple. It's to keep the region moving. And it encompasses uh, lines of business that are familiar to anyone who lives or works or travels around the New York, New Jersey area. So aviation, which includes the five major airports, Kennedy, LaGuardia, Newark, Stewart, and, and Atl- uh, Teterboro, and we also have uh, a work on Atlantic City Airport. The tunnels, bridges, and terminals, which includes the Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, the George Washington Bridge, the Gothels Bridge, and the Outer Bridge crossings. We also obviously PATH, I just talked about the PATH system, the World Trade Center, and the rebuilding of the World Trade Center campus. So the Port Authority owned and operated uh, the world, the original World Trade Center, We built it, our engineers built that building, um, and we were asked to step in and help uh, put that campus back together, uh, both after the 93 World Trade Center attacks and after 9-11. And so we have a a line of business dedicated to the World Trade Center. We also operate the ports of New York and New Jersey. Uh, We have an operation services function that really you know, forms the basis for a very large maintenance workforce. In addition to that, because we're a bi-state agency, uh, so we were incorporated in 1921 as an act of Congress. It was thought that the Port District, which is really 25 miles around the Statue of Liberty, so New York Harbor, was such an important and valuable piece of not just real estate, but economic engine that uh, something like the Port Authority, a very new entity, had to be developed so that we could make uh, decisions in the best interest of that region. So that is the the area that we cover and a little bit beyond that. So the the Port Authority is an instrumentality of New York and New Jersey, uh, has a board of commissioners, uh, six appointed by the governor of New Jersey, six appointed by the governor of New York, Our executive director uh, is appointed by the governor of New York, our chairman of the board by the governor of New Jersey. So you might imagine um, one of the reasons that the Port Authority 
uh, was incorporated in 1921 is because the states were firing cannonballs across the river at each other because they couldn't agree on anything. So we brought a, a structure together, a very unique structure that really seeks to do things in the best interest of the region and to welcome people from all over the world into the New York, New Jersey metropolitan region. I am one of 12 chiefs who are report directly to the executive director who are in charge of what is now 8,000 employees. And it's a very diverse group of employees, which part of what makes it so interesting. We have our own police force. So we have 2,200 police officers, detectives, sergeants, and lieutenants. Um, We have operations folks who help uh, keep terminals operating, keep berths operating, run the path system. We have maintenance folks who do things like uh, paving runways at the airports, plumbers and general maintainers. And we also have a very large uh, management staff of about 2,100 people from very diverse lines of business. So the interesting thing about the Port Authority is you can spend an entire career in the Port Authority and you can have what we like to call different tours of duty. So different opportunities to work in very diverse areas without actually leaving the organization. So we pride ourselves in public service um, and with people that have long histories with the organization, which at critical times or crisis, uh, times of crisis actually uh, work to our advantage quite well and something we've been able to leverage across time. So that gives you a little bit of, uh, you mentioned 23 unions, negotiations for all of 23 of those unions uh, falls under my purview, as does an employer of choice initiative, as does DE&I is a separate function. We do have a chief diversity and inclusion officer, but we work very closely in human capital uh, with them to really uh, get very interesting and innovative diversity and inclusion initiatives over the finish line for the organization. So that's a little bit of a summary of the Port Authority. Well, that could have been the entire podcast, just trying to help people get their heads wrapped around the, the scope of, of the, the challenge. Uh, but but thank you for, for walking us through this. I have one question before we, we shift gears a bit. I know you mentioned shooting cannonballs between you know New York and New Jersey. And so I'm glad that that no longer happens as a New Jersey resident. But I guess you would have by this time settled the question of who actually owns the Statue of Liberty. Is it New York? Is it New Jersey? Where do we land? Well, the good the good thing about that question, Rebecca, is that it's not a transportation facility, so not under our purview. So okay. we're we we're agnostic on who owns it. <laughs> okay, so it's one of the few things you don't have oversight on. It. That's probably a relief. Right. Well, you know, I, I think it's really important to get a sense of that because where I, I'd like to to maybe uh, go now is is to have you share with us the way in which you and your colleagues, uh, the other chiefs, were uh, thrown into a situation that impacted Americans in such a deep and profound way. And I, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that experience and how you and your, your fellow chiefs, you know, led through that, but also how you galvanize the HR function to sort of not just the immediate uh, impact, but, but for years afterwards. And so much of the incredible work that was done, which I had the privilege of, of getting an inside tour uh, years ago, and, and I, I was so impressed with it. And I, I'd love for you to tell the story. Sure. So, you know, the the story really starts, as I said, in the 70s with the Port Authority building the World Trade Center complex, the North and South Tower, and and, uh, operating that 16 acres around the World Trade Center. And I would say that a pivotal moment happened in 1993 with the first bombing of the World Trade Center. And that was really the wake-up call that the organization needed, and I think the country needed, that things were not normal and they were never, they were going to be different from that point forward. So in 1993, with the bombing of the World Trade Center, I had just stepped off an elevator in World Trade Center 1 when the the blast took place. As you know, the terrorists had driven a van into the basement of the World Trade Center, parked it against a structural column in hopes to bring the, the World Trade Center down. And in fact, as you know, it stood it withstood that. It did blow a 300 square foot, you know, cavern into 
the basement of the World Trade Center and really threw the organization into a fair amount of havoc. One of the first priority was how to get 30,000 people out of a building safely. And the major challenge really, because again, remember before all of these terrorist attacks started to happen, security was a, a was not top of mind. It was there certainly, and it was adequate for what we knew, but it was not top of mind. So first order of business was evacuating people safely out of that building. It took us eight hours to do so. You probably remember seeing people who had smoke, black smoke around their faces. Um, That was largely because the the elevator shafts, the way the building was designed, the elevator shafts acted as chimneys to pull the smoke up into the building and throughout. Uh, So getting down, which was by stairs, out of that building was quite a challenge and took quite a long time. We did lose five people in the World Trade Center blast uh, who were located in and around where the blast actually happened. But that was our wake-up call. And the wake-up call was, if it happened once, it could happen again. Security became one of our most important functional areas. We hired a chief security officer Uh, to oversee the security function, not just at the World Trade Center, but at all of our facilities. And what became very routine in those days was practice. Practice meaning something happens in the building, uh, you know exactly where you're going to go, you know exactly how you're going to evacuate, you know exactly where you're going to report to, so that we're able to, in the Human Resources Department, able to account for each and every employee who was in that building on that day. So we had a lot of practice and a number of years in which we would routinely carry out drills. One of the things that we realized was we had disabled employees on our floors. One gentleman who was on the 62nd floor was carried down 124 flights of stairs in his wheelchair, um, and which is really a crazy feat um, to, to carry out. And so we put things like evacuation chairs so that disabled folks could be carried down in an evacuation chair. Uh, we put lighting so that when the lights went out, folks could see the the lighting uh, that was in the stairwells. We made sure people understood where the stairwells were. As I said, we did practice drills. We, we created a system in which people could call in and say, I'm fine. I'm here. I'm fine. So that we didn't have to send people to their homes to try and find out where people were. So just a, a lot of preparation. That actually ended up being a, a, a wonderful thing for us to do um, because on 9-11, again, with no notice and no warning, the first building was attacked at 846, again, with no warning as people were coming into the office. And then the second, I was on the 67th floor of One World Trade Center when the building was hit um, and it became um, an exercise, a drill What we didn't know is in 1993, we had eight hours to get people out of the building. What we had in 9-11 was 102 minutes to to evacuate people safely. And it was really thanks to all the hard work and the preparation and the, the, you know, just people understanding very quickly without any conversation where they had to go and what they had to do. The PA systems had been knocked out. There were no announcements. And so being able to evacuate that building was was really became so routine that it really saved a vast number of lives, I believe. Point of impact was the 89th floor, any pretty much with few exceptions, anyone above the point of impact in the first building did not make it out of the building, including our executive director who was on Windows on the World. And then as you know, firefighters, police officers, Uh, police personnel from all around, not just Port Authority, but from NYPD and all jurisdictions all around the New York and New Jersey airport came to aid uh, the evacuation of people out of the building. So we started evacuating the building immediately. We had a a central point uh, where we gathered, you know, things had flown off the desks, off the bookshelves. It was clear that something had hit the building. I think it was less clear Uh, certainly in the early um, moments of it, that this was intentional and not an accident. So we had all decided that, we had all decided that a a pilot must have had a heart attack. It must have been a small commuter plane. In fact, obviously it was not, but it took a long time, I think, for people, particularly in the building, to actually figure out that that's what happened. 
we just started to descend the stairs pretty quickly. The stairs of the World Trade Center are quite wide, two people across. Everywhere you looked, both up the stairs and down the stairs were filled with people, but it was quite orderly, again, because I think most of us didn't really understand what was happening. At about the 26th floor, uh, you, you start to encounter firefighters, so you knew if if they could get up, you could get down. And so people start to 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 really in earnest, you know, make their way down the stairs. The plaza, the World Trade Center, which is where you would normally go with that huge fountain, that sphere that's now located at on the World Trade Center campus, you can still see that plaza was closed off because at that point people were uh, jumping out of the building. Um, to their deaths, and you can only imagine, you know, the, that that was a better decision than whatever it was they were facing on the floor. In the meantime, as we were going down the stairs, the second building was hit much lower, but fewer, far fewer people died above the point of impact because most people, when they saw what was happening in the building next door, fled and and took the elevators and exited the building. So couple of blocks away from the building, there's a rumble in the sidewalk and we turn around and we start to see that the building is falling. And so a number of us were caught in the collapse of the building. It took probably 20 to 30 minutes before you could actually see. It was, it went dark. And then, and then you began your trek to try and figure out who you were with, where you were going, how you were going to get home, how you were going to communicate with your loved ones to let them know that you were okay. I have three kids and both my husband at the time and I were both in the building and our three kids were in school together. So, you know, you had relatives who were coming from all over the country to come in and grab your children because no one quite knew what was happening for many, many hours. We were back at work the next day and the major work that had to be done by the human resources department was again to find people and make sure that they were okay and to create a list of those who were missing. And part of that um, had to do with trying to identify where people had been, what offices they might have been in, did they come to work that day, were they at another facility. Sometimes it took people a couple of days to get home before we were able to track them down because they didn't have a way to communicate with us. We moved all of our corporate staff to our other locations and other facilities throughout New York and New Jersey, and again, began the work of rescue and evaluating uh, the building and, and what was happening or what would happen to the building, um, and then finding, finding people. The amazing thing about Port Authority staff is they are unbelievable in a moment of crisis. So it didn't make any difference what your title was. It didn't make any difference what your function was. If you were needed to do something, people stepped up from all over the organization, including retirees who came back to the Port Authority to help. And that was very helpful in the case of a number of engineers who had actually built the World Trade Center and actually had schematic drawings at home of the, of the building uh, when, you know, when we needed help with, with trying to identify different parts of the building that had collapsed and where they had collapsed. The fires burned on the site uh, for about eight months at 1,500 degrees. Uh, they were enormously hot. The, the scene shifted every day because pieces of the building would melt and shift. It was treacherous work. And, you know, obviously our officers, uh, firemen, were dedicated to finding as many of their fallen colleagues as they possibly could and to to bring them home to for people. So while this was going on, you know, again, the business of human resources, when we identified, were able to identify a, a colleague, there were notifications that went on to family members. There were uh, funerals that needed to be planned. There was there were crisis centers that were set up for family members to and, and try and understand, you know, if their loved one wasn't found alive, what would happen to them. And a couple of things that the organization did, decisions they made that I think were really important ones. One was this happened on a Tuesday. Payroll was Friday. Uh, we made payroll for every single person. Our comptroller, in some cases, hand wrote checks out. In the case of folks who were missing loved ones, we delivered those checks to their homes. And just not 
having to be burdened by the financial potential financial loss and understand what that meant was really important to the organization and really important to the families of those who were missing. Ultimately, we lost 84 people. It could have been uh, far more tragic. 30 of those were police officers, including our superintendent of police, our director of public safety, who was in the building trying to get to our executive director, oddly enough. So, you know, we, we lost our entire command staff, our senior command staff of our police force. And there, you know, it was just, uh, it was something that really rocked you to your core. You were trying to keep the organization moving and trying to keep business moving while you were, you know, grieving and, and trying to just process your own trauma that you had from, you know, either friends not being there or, again, we're a long service organization. So we have a lot of folks who've known each other for many, many, many years. But so the the HR function uh, played a really significant role, I think, in mental health as well. We coordinated with our employee assistance programs and we brought in counselors on site so that, you know, when you were there and you had a moment, you could step into a room and, and seek counseling immediately. You didn't have to wait. You didn't have to worry about coming home and trying to wrestle it on your own. This was pre-COVID days, so Zoom and those kinds of things didn't really exist. So we put, we actually put people at all of our facilities to help really folks who were struggling. And you were moving so fast and trying to get the organization up on its feet and up and running that sometimes you didn't even realize that you needed help. So we relied a great deal on our colleagues tapping us on the shoulder and going, okay, it's your turn. You need to go, you need to go talk to someone. That was usually uh had, you know, when people were doing things like taking a pot of coffee and, and putting it in the refrigerator, you know, and and just things that because your mind wasn't there, it was trying to process so many things. And at the same time, as I said, trying to keep the organization up and running. Uh, we established a World Trade Center fund, a survivors fund for those families who uh, lost loved ones and were able at the end of a number of months to present each family with almost a hundred thousand dollar check to contribution from employees to, to just keep them going. We made the decision that we were going to pay those employees that were lost for six months, their regular paychecks until sort of the dust settled and families could start to figure out what they were going to do. And in HR, we had employee liaisons who worked with the families on pretty much any any question, anything that they had, benefits, life insurance, health care, you know, just trying to orient them to what their lives would be like in the future. So it was a daunting task, but it really showed the strength and resilience of people of this organization, that they were actually able um, under those really horrible circumstances to stand up and keep going and to keep the work moving and to do whatever it took at whatever time of night. We work 24 seven, uh, folks work 12 hour shifts of uh, six or seven days a week for months and months and months. Um, and they did it gladly. There were, there were, you know, it's times like that when the, when the difference between a management employee and a union employee disappears. And you're just human beings and you just step in and you do whatever it is you need to do to keep the place moving. One of the challenges for us is we had um, over the next 13 years, we had eight executive directors. So it was a daunting task to try and lead the agency under those circumstances. And it made it very, very difficult when you didn't have a CEO in place for any you know, period of time to actually you know, get a vision. So you were basically kind of surviving. What at that point is when the chiefs, the senior most people in the organization, I think we really solidified our team because we recognized that if we weren't a solid team and we didn't collaborate um, efficiently and effectively with one another, um, that the organization, you know, potentially would lose a lot of ground and, and you know, really fall apart. And so you know, folks started stepping up in ways that was, the behavior was quite different than it had been 
previously. It was far more collaborative, far more team oriented, kinder and gentler than than perhaps it had been in the past. And I think um, you know those lessons learned. There are still 450 people in the organization who were in the World Trade Center towers on 9/11 who are still with the organization. We have uh, a number of things that we put in place to continue to recognize those individuals that we lost and make sure that we don't forget. And we have found ways for new employees who were not part of that, some of whom were not even born on 9-11, um, to participate in those efforts uh, through days of giving with charitable events and obviously being at the World Trade Center campus itself and honoring those individuals at the memorial pools. Mary Lee, that is an extraordinary story. And I hope no one ever has to go through what you and your team and your colleagues did. I cannot imagine that this didn't change fundamentally who you were as a leader and your function. I wonder if in retrospect, you know, how did some of those experiences prepare you for a different world? As you mentioned, that the world has changed. And when other crises came along, so for example, COVID or unrest, I mean, the trains have to run and the planes have to fly and, the, you know, we have to keep the city safe and all those things. And you have to soldier on. But it's an incredible story. What what lessons would you or, or what takeaways would you share w- with others who may someday be faced with something, hopefully never, but something just as challenging? Sure. So, yeah, good, great examples. The, the social unrest, COVID, you know, things that were unimaginable again. I think the lessons learned for this organization and those that we tapped into in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder and and with COVID, I think we're around being human first. And we all have a job to do. We all have, you know, we have an organization to support. We have a mission, but it it is a much more caring organization, one in which uh, we recognize the individual needs of folks We gear um, programs and tailor programs to to things that are more personal to each individual rather than, you know, I think I think what we used to do is we throw a program out there and say, you know, corporately, this is it. It might work for you. It might not work for you. That's just the way it is. And now we're much more cognizant that people come from different places. They have different perspectives. They have different realities. They've gone through completely different experiences. And there needs to be a way to tailor the human resources initiatives, the employer of choice initiatives, the things that make you want to come here. If the work isn't enough and the work is amazing, a whole new LaGuardia Airport, and a new Newark Terminal A, uh, almost completely finished World Trade Center campus, and the list goes on and on of, of work that, that we're doing, really substantive, solid work that we're doing. But if that work isn't enough, the thing that that may draw you to the Port Authority, but the things that keep you in this organization are the human connection and the ability to craft um, a career and to craft programming around what's important to you that allows you to be who you are, to come with your whole professional self into the workplace and really have us take advantage of all the diverse perspectives that folks bring with us. And I, and I think some of that was because, you know, we were quite frankly, you know, brought to our knees after 9-11. And, you know, you didn't get up alone. You got up with the help of other people. You listened to other people in a way perhaps you hadn't before. It didn't make any difference what level someone was. It was the contribution they made. And I think that's really important, um, especially today with future generations coming into the workplace where they're probably not going to stay here 36 years like I did. That was my choice. And I'm I'm happy I made that active choice to stay. But not everybody needs to. There's still a wonderful contribution they can make in the time frame they're here. And we want them to know that this is a wonderful place to work. And not just the work you do, but the people you do it with and the way in which the organization treats you. Um, and and Hopefully, you know, it speaks to the the very heart of public service and what it's all about and why we do this. Mary Lee, thank you. Thank you for telling this incredible story and for all that you did. It's been a real privilege today to to have you uh, on the show. And thank you. 
Thank you, Rebecca. It's the, the conference board is always a, a good friend uh, to the Port Authority, and I, I value the work that you and I specifically have been able to do over the years. So thanks for having me. Of course. And thank you for the contribution and gift to others who are listening. So thank you so very much. It's uh, been a pleasure. And I want to encourage our listeners to uh, listen to the entire series. There's some wonderful people and stories that we've been able to capture. And thanks for listening. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.